and cheese. Pleasure to have with us Gannon Gillespie from Toastot. Gannon, welcome. Thanks. Good to be here. Uh, so Toastot, as a, an organization for people who don't know, kind of describe what you do. Well, Toastot is a U.S. registered international organization, but we are born and based in Senegal in West Africa, and we're working in eight countries, uh, both in West and East Africa. And um, Tostan's model really is to take traditional development and sort of turn it on its head. And the idea is that every development project, whether it's in governance, education, health, whatever the sector, works better if the community is prepared and educated with the basic skills and information they need to make their own changes and set their own priorities for the future. And who changes, who dis determines what that education is going to be? We do. We've, we've spent the last 30 years uh, developing a community-led curriculum. So we're, we're, it's really kind of a greatest hits of what communities want to know about in order to make the changes that they care about in, in their lives. And that's economic empowerment and basic financial skills. It's basic literacy, math, um, and, and it's also about health and, and understanding the human body and the diseases that they're confronted with. Um, but all rooted in a, in, in a discussion of values and what, what are our priorities? Where are we trying to go and how do we want to work together as, as we go there? You know, I've got your business card here. Yeah. And as I pull it out, I see the words uh, dignity for all right yeah. under toast on. I'm, gla I'm glad you noticed that. We just, uh, we just went through a, uh, an effort to, uh, to think about our brand and, and, our, and our wording very carefully. Um, Dignity for All has been our vision statement uh, for many years, and we really landed on that because it, 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 human dignity is really what we're often talking about at the local level. Mm -hmm. What are the basic human rights and responsibilities that we all have in whatever community that we're, we're living in or, or um, visiting, and, and what, do, what do we want to do to reinforce those and ensure that everybody can, can benefit from the, from the resources that we have? I've got to ask you this, though. Sure. Basic human rights, that means, doesn't mean the same thing everywhere, or does it? No, and that's, uh, it's a really great question. Tostan was really one of the first organizations to focus on con uh, contextualizing human rights and responsibilities at the local level. We're working in 26 local African languages. And in our model, you, uh, human rights are not presented uh, as some, some sort of um, uh, foregone conclusion that has been decided on far away from you. They're presented as questions. What, what do we think about these human rights that have been established as international standards? Why, why were these standards established and how does our experience in this community relate to those? What, and, and that involves asking hard questions. When, when did children's rights take, take precedence over, over human rights or how does that work? What do we think about women's rights? What do we think about um, the uh, right to be free from violence or discrimination? Those discussions are just as hard in, in a West African village as they would be here in the U.S. But by having those conversations, people can voice their, their opinions and all of a sudden find their common ground and begin to, to take action on areas that they, they unite around. For example, you might say, wow, we, we now see the connection between registering our children at birth and then later in life, they're able to register for school, they're able to get a passport, they're able to do all these other things. And that's actually a very easy and direct process that we tomorrow can go and begin registering babies and keeping track of babies that are born and making sure they get that done. That's just a very tiny example, but there's a lot of examples like that of things that communities can easily do to chart a new future. But who doesn't want that and why? Who doesn't want? The registration at birth. It, that's, that's what's interesting about it is that it's not that there's any one person who didn't want it. It was that it was kind of people hadn't had the chance to discuss why it was important and connect those dots. I see. And also, in many of the communities where we're working, there has been no formal school ever. And so the basic, basic education and basic information that you and I and, and many people in, in the modern world take for granted, people just have not had access to it. Mm -hmm. So it's not a problem of intelligence, it's really a problem of access to information. And as people start to put those dots together, like you said, it's a pretty, it's a pretty quick conclusion that people reach. It's mm -hmm. similar to the one when people start to really talk about access to education and the value of keeping our girls in school longer. When that discussion happens, it's, it, it can easily move in a very positive direction very quickly. We're in a, a, a noisy lobby at the yes. Waldorf Astoria here at the, the Hilton Humanitarian Awards. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Hilton Humanitarian Awards and, and the Hilton Foundation itself has been pretty important to Tostan, hasn't it? Yeah, that might even be an understatement. Um, in 2007, Tostan was lucky enough to receive the Conrad and Hilton Humanitarian Prize, um, especially recognizing our work on ending the practice of female genital cutting and child marriage, which a lot of the communities that have gone through our model have chosen to, um, to abandon. Um, why this 
this particular experience in, in winning the prize and then being a part of the Hilton community has been um, so so uh, important to toast on has been on really across three levels. One, the actual winning of the prize. We, we're the smallest NGO to ever have won the prize, mm -hmm. and so when that happened, it was it was a huge shift for us. Um, it, we we were all of a sudden catapulted into just another realm of people knowing knowing our name and, and knowing our work and, and recognizing us, and that's continued straight through to this day. It's a real stamp of approval and credibility. Um, but it also uh, started slowly to, to give us access to bi bilateral partnerships, groups that we met by coming to these, these Hilton Symposium. And so we've worked with Operation Smile as another, another grantee. We're working with Heifer right now. We're working with PATH. Those emerged as organic relationships through the, the network that we've, we've created. And Tostan is happy to be right now on the executive um, executive Leadership Committee of the Hilton Humanitarian Prize Laureates, which is a self-organized group that's trying to come together and figure out how we can collaborate better. You know, you talk about the female genital cutting, mm -hmm. others call it female genital mm -hmm. mutilation. Uh, here on Rainmakers, we've done quite a few uh, interviews recently where the issue has come up. And so now there seems to finally be uh, more and more light being, being shown upon it. My question is, is that in still in some places in some parts of Africa, as many as as much as ninety percent of the girls that still happens to, I don't understand the cultural tradition. Can you help me? I th I think I can. I think all cultures, and and I want to preface this by saying that I'm not trying to compare female genital cutting to any other uh, practice, but I think all cultures can have what some of the academics that we work with might call mistaken practices or practices that they're that they're carrying out and may not realize the full consequence of. Um, and uh, what we found is that actually the, the, the mothers of Africa, who are often very directly involved in this practice, are often carrying out this practice because they love their daughters and because there really is no alternative that they can see. Because the practice, especially when 90% or more of your peers, your family members, it's expected. It's, it's often not questioned, but even if it is questioned, you as an individual can't imagine your daughter having a successful future in not doing this practice. So the minute that you decided not to cut her, everyone would know, and that would begin a process of shaming and name calling and dishonor and disgrace for the family. Now some, it is true, some women, and certainly this was true in, in Tostan's model, there are some women who are willing to take that risk. But it's a very real risk, and it's a real risk to the daughter. And so what often happens is that the norm perpetuates itself because everyone thinks, well, I'm not, enough, me alone, I can't do this. And also no one wants to be the one person standing up at a public meeting saying we have to talk about this thing that's totally taboo and we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. That's also very hard, but that's where our education model seems to have played a critical role. Our classes meet three times a week for three hours a day. They're predominantly women in the class, but it's very important that we have men there as well. Mm -hmm. As the discussion evolves and as, as that topic comes out and as they learn about communities that have abandoned it and communities that never practiced it, and in, in many cases they may have associated this with Islam, but they learn that there are many Muslim countries that don't have this practice at all. All of a sudden they're saying, well, that's interesting. Let's go talk to our local religious leader about this. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they find out that he actually hasn't cut his daughters. It starts to, again, unearth the realities of the practice, both the consequences and then also people's existing uh, positions towards it. And it, what they discover often in the class is that they have shared experiences, very tough experiences with, with daughters who have died. They themselves have experienced the consequences, and these are things that have never been discussed. And so I would say that it's not about a, an active choice until people are really talking about the practice and all that it means to them within the culture. Mm -hmm. And then we see that they, they normally choose to abandon it. Not everyone, there, there are pockets of resistance and, and people of course have a wide range of opinions, but it's a very, very hard thing when a mother is explaining all of the things that have happened to her daughters to the, to the, the gathered group. It's very hard to advocate to continue something like that. When you bring uh, Tostan into a new area, what is, what's the biggest barrier that you have to overcome and how do you overcome it? Um, you know, I, I would say that we've uh, overcome maybe dozens of barriers and, and what's interesting about our model and, and the vision that our founder Molly Melching had in, in creating this model is that it's kind of constantly adaptive. 
And so um, built into the way we go into a, a new region or a new country is this really slow process. We, we, we focus a lot on trust at Toaston. We really want to have a trusting relationship with every community we're working with, and one in which they can count on us for what we've promised and which we can count on them for what they've promised as a rela in relation to our program. And so um, the hurdles can be misunderstandings, right? Mm -hmm. So they may not realize what, what our model is. Often pe people have had repeated experiences of someone sort of showing up and saying, we, we want to do this project. And sometimes they do a great job of, of really interacting with the community. Other times they may have showed up that one time, promised a lot of things and never come back. They may have showed up and delivered half or built half of the well and then they didn't have all the funding. So we have to kind of, we have to move beyond that and really have a long discussion with the community leaders and then the gathered community about what our model is and ask them, do you want this? It might not be the right time right now. Yeah. And really make it a choice that they can make. And that I think makes a, a big difference. Now, you have to work with governments as well. Mm -hmm. uh, are they your partners or are they participants? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I would say they're, they're both in that we, we're really a, a learning organization and we're, we're constantly kind of promoting the idea of constantly learning from one another. And the government certainly fit into that paradigm. They're, at, the, at the local level, they're, they're critical to our model. Mm -hmm. um, our communities are deeply engaged with their local elected officials and their representatives trying to bring the issues that are coming up in our class to them. So uh, we've had a lot of communities that would say, look, we don't have any health resource within five kilometers. We will physically build a health hut. If you will, at least once every two weeks or a month, send one of your health workers to that hut so we can get basic, basic medical mm -hmm. care. Trying to negotiate, or in the cases of school registration, sometimes you might have um, a penalty if someone is dropped out of school and getting them re-enrolled, actually the cost of that penalty goes up for every month that they're out of school, which means that the likelihood it goes down and down as the person stays out of school. Mm -hmm. Those things can be negotiated because actually at the end of the day, those local elected officials want higher enrollment. They want to see more girls back in school. So the community's ability to go and engage with that local elected official is, is critical. Can you give us some examples, um, I mean, of some shining cities out there or, sh or shining villages or, or areas that you would like for everybody to know that this is where Tostan has been? Sure. Um, well, one of the things that we're most excited about right now is what's going on related to female genital cutting in Senegal. The government now has really uh, stepped up. They've launched a national action plan mm -hmm. um, to, to see the end of the practice in the next few years. And they're, they're very serious about that. And so that is about coordinating. And it's not about you know, this is much bigger than Tostan now, and this is much bigger than any one sort of group of community leaders. This is really now about uh, how can we bring together the entire group of actors that are working on this. Certainly starts with the local community leaders that have kind of led the charge and said, we're abandoning this and we want our neighbors to do that too. That's kind of the only way this practice can change, we found. But then it's about as the abandonment takes place, it brings up other issues. So this whole process has unearthed, you know, connections between especially child marriage, but also uh, female genital cutting and fistula. Mm -hmm. And how can we make sure that women who have had experiences and negative health outcomes related to some of these issues, how can they get treatment, right? So as the practice abandons, it, ch it changes the focus. And we need to be talking about not just the end of the practice, but how do we move on and how do we make sure that the practice, how the communities are monitoring the, the end and then how can we take care of those who've already been affected and especially not make sure that the stigma doesn't switch to the negative and that if it, because right now in many communities, if you're uncut, that's a bad thing. If you're a girl who's uncut, mm -hmm. that's a negative. But the risk would be that if you, if you see abandonment, then it could be a bad thing to have been cut. So we, we see a lot of communities also trying to make sure that people aren't stigmatizing in reverse after the abandonment. It's very, it's very interesting to think about the bigger picture and all the unintended consequences that can come about. Wow, you sound like you have a pretty difficult job trying to bring dignity for all. Um, you know, it, it, it sounds like that, but actually when, when you see, when you see uh, how, how deeply interested the communities we work, work with are in, in all of these issues, it, it feels kind of easy. <laughs> okay, well, let, let's say something easy then. Yeah. Uh, we're coming back here five years from now. You're sitting right there, and I'm sitting right here, and I'm asking you the, the, this one question. How'd you do? What are you going to say? Um, so in five years, I would really love to tell you that Tostan had been able to scale up 
in West Africa. Uh, it's what we've been focused on this year and we've been launching this year. We've launched a 1,000 community initiative mm -hmm. that's, that's being supported by a wide range of our, our existing and some new supporters. It's very, very ambitious. And I, in five years, I would love to tell you that we took that, demonstrated in three of those five years what we could do, and then we were able to scale that up to, say, three or 5,000 communities uh, across West Africa. At the same time, I would hope to tell you that our, our training initiative that we've, we've been uh, soft launching and will launch officially in 2015 has really taken off and that we've been able to train, uh, let's, in five years, let's say a few dozen local NGOs in our approach and our model, not only maybe in Africa, but from around the world mm -hmm. so that they can benefit from, from some of the, the experiences we've had and so that we can learn from them as they go back and implement it. Okay, well, then that's a promise. I'll send you a okay. meeting invite five years from now. We'll see you right here. All right. All right. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Rainmaker believes we can change the world One life, one heart, one soul, one mind at a time Rainmaker believes we can change